Go ahead, Felipe. Uh, no, I just wanted to start the recording. That, that's Go great. Ahead. Thank you. I realize it's been a long day. Feel free to stand up, do jumping jacks, do push-ups, walk around the desk or whatever helps you get some fresh air uh, flowing into your, your system. But um, I'm delighted to, uh, to chair this panel to discuss this newly published book, which I have in my hands. I got myself 10 copies. And if we were meeting in person, I would be giving each of you a copy of this book because I like the aesthetics of these things. I like to hold them. I like to smell them. I like to touch the paper. But um, the only thing I want to say is why did I invite uh, all of you? I hope you all students and graduates should have received an invitation uh, to write a chapter here and um, to do this. I think I did it for three reasons, and maybe there is the real reason. So the, the first reason is I, I wanted us together to think about the impact of education, of COVID on education, and I wanted us to think about what we're going to do. And at least in my experience, I often don't know what I think about a topic until I write it. And then once I write it, I know what my thoughts are, and then I can change my mind. But until you write it, uh, a thought is a very fluid kind of thing. You can change your mind and not even realize you're changing your mind. But once you write it, a thought takes a certain gravity. It becomes real in a different way, especially if you make it public. So that was one reason. I thought that this moment was serious enough that it needed the gravity of some thoughts in writing about what is, what is COVID doing to education and what do you think it's going to do? The second reason I wanted to write this is because I have a hunch that this is a time that, that calls for great solidarity. And when I look at the educational system, it seems to me that universities uh, are really the best position to be of help. And I think there is a risk that in this context, you know, a lot of people are gonna look for how do we take care of ourselves and our families and universities are gonna take care of themselves. But I don't think this is gonna get us out of this crisis. I think this is a moment where we ought to be looking for those who need more help. And I think universities, there are 28,000 of them, as I say in the introduction, are in a position to be of service to school systems. And if there is a time when it's been necessary to do that, this is it. So that I make that point there, and I try to illustrate that point with that short history of the Ed School. Um, I am working on a project to write a history of international education at the Ed School uh, one day for real. And I had, I've been toying with that idea now for a few years and I had been to the archives and I have some notes and I think I, there's a story forming, but um, when I decided to write this book, we, I didn't have access to the archives. So I had to depend on that, but I took the same idea that universities and this one in particular could be of service at this moment to school systems and, um, and develop that section. And the third reason is I thought that this moment, uh, this moment is gonna mark the rest of our lives for as long as we live. And I wanted to capture this moment in a bottle. I wanted to put some of those reflections because I suspect that we will be going back to that book. And for those of you who have kids or who have grandchildren, they will ask you, what was it like to live in the pandemic of 2020? And memories can play all kinds of tricks on us. So I thought it would be good to have those thoughts recorded in a bottle. So you could go back and say, well, at least this is what I wrote um, at that time. But maybe there's a, the real reason is I needed a little hope. And whenever I need a little hope, I look to you. I mean, there are times when I look at this impact and I am really worried about what this is going to do to civilized coexistence on this planet. And not just to solidarity and poverty and inequality, which I think is going to be brutal, but it's going to be the ripple effects of that. You know, what happens to a society? or all kinds of pre-existing challenges get accelerated because you throw something like a pandemic on them. And so I need a little hope and I thought, well, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to write to my former students and I'm going to ask them, what do you think about that? And just reading their work is going to give me hope. So those are the, that's the motivation for that. So without further ado, we have a phenomenal panel today um, of five of the authors. I had to pick, so I picked five. Uh, Nicole, Janvi, Mine, Angela, and Kevin. And I'm going to ask all of them to speak to two questions, but in two parts. So they, they have three minutes to address each one of them. So the first question is thinking about what you wrote, and this is a sample of five essays, five different people, different parts of the world, different sectors and so on. Um, what are the key messages in your essay? When you think about how these pandemic impacted your own leadership, 
um, how did you do it? And uh, what were the lessons that come from your own experience? And then I'll ask you another question, which is about the rest of the book. But let's begin with that one. So why don't I start with you, Nicole? Sure, thank you. Thank you, Fernando. And thank you for the opportunity with this book to reflect and get out of the autopilot <laughs> um, uh, in order to, to take note of what, what, what we're going through. Um, so some of my, the lessons that um, I've learned during this pandemic have to do with the importance of trust and of establishing shared responsibility. I work at a nonprofit organization that um, implements professional development programs with public sector partners. And um, I think I understood how crucial relationship building was, but it became even more crucial now um, to invest time and effort um, with curiosity, with humility, to understand the local context with which we work, uh, to understand the needs, to, uh, to be able to see connections that may not be clear uh, if you do not listen, um, which doesn't necessarily mean that listening is inconsistent with having structured content, structured materials, structured strategies, uh, but that it is important to have this systematized knowledge be flexible enough uh, in order to address the specific needs of different places at different times. Um, and in that process, um, being open and considering different courses of action. So not getting attached to a particular one, um, even though that might seem like the best answer at the moment. Uh, so in, in the spirit of collaboration and of really listening, uh, I, I and the team that I work with, we've had to uh, give up on certain ideas, on, on certain principles. And I think having the eyes to see that maybe there are other opportunities that can open up when you change course is really important because if you are closed off to, with certain ideas, you may not be able to see the potential of others. Um, so that was very important. And just to close up, I think something that I, believed before and I think was reinforced during the course of, of, of our response to the pandemic is the importance of having a formative perspective, approaching implementing programs uh, as a formative experience for everybody in the system. Uh, teachers are learning how to do this, principals are learning how to do this, secretaries of education are learning how to do this, and actually this is not unique to the pandemic. They were learning or we wanted them to learn new references to do things differently. Um, and so understanding that we need to model with them what we want them to, to implement in their own program. So when it comes to teachers, we wanna model with them what we want them to do with families, to request feedback, to un really understand how things are being understood, what are challenges, what are things that are invisible to us, uh, because it is perhaps easy to ask ourselves what schools need to do, um, but what do schools need and what can we help? How can we help them do what they need to do? Is the question that I think has permeated this whole period. And I hope that it continues to guide um, my work going forward. Thank you so much, Nicole. Um, well said, Janvi. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And you're right, it really gave me a chance to think about what I was feeling through this. And when I was rereading it today, I have to say, I forgot a lot of it already. So thank you for that. So for, for me, really, this, this time was a cry for action because there's this just deep necessity for innovation. I work at a foundation that supports the world's most marginalized. And for them, they really just had no options. But this was also just this golden opportunity because suddenly we were just freed from all the shackles that usually innovation faces. This whole idea of experimenting with the child's future, being afraid of trying something new. It was sort of a golden time because we could do everything we always wanted to focus on 21st century skills, curiosity led learning, real world conceptual learning. So really that shift to the mindset that we had to bring amongst parents, teachers and children to say, let's try something new because we have no choices was in my mind, the really exciting part of this whole um, time. But one of my early realizations was that the power of human-centered design, if you trust your instinct on it. So the children we work with, um, they have no internet or technology or devices. 
they have no resources, no textbooks, no books at all, and their parents are semi-literate or illiterate. So really, we were given this challenge to say, now figure it out. And we did. We just trusted our instinct. We put together this internet-free education resource bank, and it was designed specifically for these children. The, the second thing that I realized was just leading by example in terms of working harder than I've ever worked before. So I was homeschooling my children in the day and then working through the night. And there was me and another IEP grad who works with me, Lina Zahir. The two of us put together 108 projects within three months. And each project is a week long, five days worth of project-based activities, all interdisciplinary across all subjects. If you asked me six months ago, I don't think I could have told you I'm capable of that. And I wasn't trying to undersell myself. It's just, I really didn't know because we were just connected by this passion or this mission to do something for these children. Um, but on the flip side of it, from an organizational point of view, I also learned that when you're doing something which is untested, you really have to show some early results um, for the organization to trust and believe in what you're doing and continue to invest. So for us, that was sort of 120,000 learners, five countries, 24 NGO partners, nine languages, it costs less than $3. This sort of uh, rhetoric, all these numbers really helped our story uh, a lot. But then I have to say that my last takeaway was just, it's um, also very heartbreaking when you invest this much into something, every little small rejection really hurts. So every time you know, we spoke to an NGO and we knew we could help them, and then they said something and it didn't work out. Or every time we tried to share our work and we didn't get accepted for some publication or something, it genuinely hurts because you've invested so much into this. But then what, what I really tried to find, and I see this recurring through the book with many people's stories, was finding the fuel for your heart, which for me was the stories from the ground. So hearing about that one child who created a personal flotation device and managed to survive the floods because of one of our projects or a community library with the books that we worked with them on, that was just incredible. So I just have to keep recurring with that in my mind to keep uh, you know, just energized and focused. And as an innovator, what I truly feel today and as an educator is I felt like we're out of excuses. We can't let our children down for longer. We just have to deliver for every child. So for me, I'm still sort of, that's my adrenaline, which is still keeping me going. Uh, I'm sure I'll crash at some point when the homeschooling gets too much. But from the work perspective, I think that's what I've learned. Thank you so much, Janvi. Uh, Mine. Um, hello, I'm from Turkey, Istanbul. Um, so I'm, I'm running an organization called the Rural Schools Transformation Network. Uh, I'm the founder and general coordinator now. And uh, when COVID-19 started, uh, almost everything we have been doing were face-to-face, -face, uh, as you can imagine. Uh, we particularly focused on rural school teachers, how to empower them. Uh, we had uh, six different uh, local rural school teacher communities around Turkey. And we've been working with four different education faculties to support teacher candidates to, uh, to prepare uh, for working in rural schools. And we also, we've been collaborating with Ministry of Education to give uh, training of trainers to, again, like uh, to rural school teachers working in multi-grade schools. And uh, then COVID-19 started and everything was interrupted, like 99%, I can say. And uh, suddenly, like, we didn't know what to do. And it took us like two days to create an action plan. And we established a solution desk uh, with a group of volunteers and uh, some people from our team like who participated voluntarily you know in the, in the evenings because they still needed to do some stuff uh, we needed to report to the funders and uh, we we had some stuff to do and uh, then we, we built this team of uh, about 10 people and we started monitoring what's going on we had like uh, 15 whatsapp groups of teachers like from different uh, different programs different regions and uh, and we communicated with them we started uh, preparing some surveys sending them out uh, getting some results and uh, preparing like reports in short time and uh, then we started building action plans 
and uh, and what we realized uh, that almost all of the teachers had left villages so they didn't have much connection with villages and if they had it was through phone calls to parents or it was through whatsapp messages uh, but we realized like conference calls like most of the schools in the cities and private schools were using they were not available to them so we needed to use telephone calls or whatsapp messages and uh, what we created was, first of all, because we knew rural school teachers very well, it was our like area. Uh, so we started preparing some guiding documents for rural school teachers. That was the first thing we started to do. It was the easiest thing to do for us. And then second, we started creating some content for children, uh, but we uh, sound recorded them. We also thought about radio uh, later. I, I saw uh, some radio programs about uh, some radio programs in the book, uh, but we, we decided not to pick radio because uh, we realized we talked to some teachers and they said actually radio is not very much used anymore, even in the villages. Everybody is watching TV, not listening to radio. And, but almost uh, like 80% of families, they, they were using WhatsApp. So we decided to go with WhatsApp, but WhatsApp some messages because they didn't have much mobile data. Uh, so it was very, uh, very interesting also to us. It would never ever come to our mind to prepare like sound recorded uh, short stories, which included uh, many different kinds of uh, skills in them, like to, to give these skills to students. So we actually prepared 26 short stories like this during COVID-19, starting April until uh, June. Uh, we even got some extra funding for this. Somehow, like uh, we managed to find it, and we did that. And uh, so it was our first challenge uh, to like how to shift everything from face to face to online, especially when you work at village schools. And, uh, and I, I think it was not bad at all. And we also continued working with teachers. We had, uh, we actually prepared about more than 50 uh, online like Zoom meetings with teachers. And yes, we couldn't connect to some of teachers we were connecting before, but this way we could connect with some new teachers that normally we, we couldn't meet face to face, uh, which was uh, actually very good for us. And, uh, and then we had challenges with funding and uh, also like how to work as a team when we are all apart. Um, and um, and there I think having like trust-based relations, it was what saved us. And um, yes, I, I think these are the first remarks I can make. Thank you, Mine. Angela. Thank you, Fernando, for the opportunity to be here. I guess for me, this was a time to really rethink about what is our focus in education. And for us, particularly, it was a lesson on keeping equity at the center of innovation. So when Elisa, who's my co-founder, and I started thinking of how our organization would respond to the pandemic, we realized that to reach children ages zero to six, which is the target audience we work with in our organization, we needed to engage the parents. And these parents in Brazil had, for the most part, no access to internet connection. So we had to think of a way that would reach them. And we realized that we had to adapt with whatever tools we had locally based on our context. And very much like she was mentioning in her country, here in Brazil, this meant we had to do it via WhatsApp, which is pri pri pretty much one of the only tools that is free of charge. And so we had to develop a, a chat bot that was free of charge developed via WhatsApp that delivers tips and activities for parents who can then do them with their children ages zero to six. And then these activities needed to be simple enough for anyone with no background in education to be able to do them. And at the same time, engaging enough for parents to want to do them with their child, even though they were also facing all sorts of personal difficulties. Some of them needed to continue working because these are people from basic uh, jobs or who maybe had more children to take care of. So we had to balance how to make it simple enough and engaging enough. And the result of this was a set of three educational trails, as we call them, for different age ranges with multiple activities, assessments, and tips for families. And the response was phenomenal. We didn't expect it to carry out and to just for families to be so engaged. In the first month, we reached over 1,000 families in 20, 20 different states all over Brazil with over 65,000 messages being sent. And we saw that 
what I guess something that helped us during this period of the pandemic was really listening generously to what the families had to say. I guess we wouldn't have been able to understand what the educational challenge was, especially in early childhood education, if we hadn't taken the time to really listen to parents' cries for help and what they, their children were going through at home with this pandemic and what they were feeling and how they were responding to being away from their other kids from families and who did not know how to support their child's learning at home, right? And I guess another very important takeaway for me during, during this period of the pandemic is that there has to be a balance between taking action and being patient. In a moment of crisis, it's so fine what that balance is because you do need patience to listen and to take the time to think about what the best solutions will be. And at the same time, it is a crisis situation. So there has to be a sense of urgency to find solutions. But these solutions have to be rooted in a strong sense of purpose. They have to be based on your community's needs, based on what they actually need for their current situation. So I guess it's that fine balance between taking the time to listen and being patient and having a sense of urgency to respond to their needs, right? So I think it's paramount to think of these solutions together with the community. And I guess that's where the piece of listening generously comes in. So listening to them to be able to co-create these solutions that will be innovative, but at the same time that will be meaningful in their context, right? And I know that there, there will be and there are many losses that will come as a result of this pandemic, especially for the young children who are in at risk and low income communities. But I also see gains. I think one of these gains, at least for us in our organization, is parental engagement. For the first time at, in Brazil, school has always been very distant from families. Parents sort of send their child to school and assume that it's the school's responsibility now to educate them and they're okay not knowing exactly what's happening with their child. But the pandemic brought to life that the parents do have an important role in their children's upbringing, which is different from other countries. In Brazil, this is the first time this is really coming to light. And I think this is a very meaningful gain. We've heard many meaningful comments from parents who are using our service now telling us, wow, now I really understand what it is that I need to do to help my child develop during these early years, or wow, now I understand why they need early childhood educations, or I'd, I'd never thought simple activities could actually help cognitive function, or could actually help their motor skills, or their social emotional well-being. So I think there are many losses, and at the same time, there are some gains. And I think this is like a small light at the end of the tunnel when we think of this crisis situation we're living in. And I think focusing on these small gains and these small lights at the end of the tunnel is what keeps us going, despite the current crisis, despite the difficulty, difficulties we're all living in our different countries and situations. Thank you so much, Angela. Kevin. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kevin, and I graduated in 2013. And I serve as the Chief Operating Officer for Montessori Children's School. We're a boutique early education company with a focus on Montessori education. We serve about 300 students in the Northwest Houston area. And we serve ages six weeks through six years. Um, and we've learned many things um, because of this pandemic. But I think one of the most important is that entrepreneurs and the business community are critical in addressing government gaps to sustain the right to education. In Texas alone, which is a very conservative state, and I happen to live in one of the most conservative areas in Houston, um, there have been significant gaps in the delivery of education. We've had instances where early childhood centers were permitted to operate even though there was a COVID-19 case in the school. There was no PPE for nearby teachers or even in our public schools. Um, I'll give you another example. The state of Texas decided to organize a delivery of supplies for local child early childhood centers. And for a school of 300, they gave me one eight ounce bottle of hand sanitizer and one box of 100 masks to last me a month. 
So I think there have been some significant gaps in the way the government responded to the crisis. And what's unfortunate is that they didn't involve a lot of these entrepreneurs and business people who could help close those gaps. So I'm hoping that in the future, we would see appropriate incentives from government to accelerate business engagement in this space. We're already seeing it in public health. I mean, just the vaccine, um, regardless of the political context, the government has issued a series of incentives for businesses to engage in the development of a vaccine, even removing certain barriers, regardless of what we think of that, um, for its production. I would love to see a similar way for government to work much more closely with the business community and entrepreneurial community so that we can address some of these key gaps that we see in the delivery of education in a crisis. Um, one of the other things that we learned as we were managing through this was that education is just not a priority in disaster response. And I think that's been the pattern around the world. And the question for us is how do we make it a priority? What do we need to do? Do we need to reframe what we're saying? Do we need to talk about the economic impact? Do we need to rethink how we're approaching these issues when we're approaching public leaders who invest in public education? And for me, that is really what will accelerate um, increased funding and increased engagement from the business community to close these gaps that we see in order to reach every child. Um, and another thing that we learned from an organizational standpoint, um, from, a, from a leadership perspective, is that one way to sustain these crises is ensuring you have a very strong organizational culture. In our schools, for example, we closed everything in April 2020. That meant no revenue. That meant there's no revenue to pay my teachers. There's no revenue to support the tax, the property taxes we have to pay. So what helped was that we had an amazing organizational culture within our schools. Our parents decided to pay tuition anyway, even though we weren't providing a service and they didn't ask us to give it back. So that allowed us to sustain our operations um, in April and part of May before we could even accept a PPP loan from the government, which is a loan forgiveness program from the United, in the United States. So I think it's really critical that before disaster strikes, and I think this is something we've also learned in Hurricane Harvey in Houston, is how do we create a culture that is supportive and will sustain our enterprise through times of disaster. What is important in this culture? Why is it important? Um, and how do we drive it forward? And another key thing that we learned was about how do we deliver enriching online experiences for young learners who really need very sensorial active activities. And that proved immensely challenging in a Montessori setting, which is entirely dependent on a series of hands-on materials. So we actually developed a series of plastic material kits that parents were able to pick up from our locations. But I think a lot of these innovative ideas are only possible when you have really innovative entrepreneurs working on through these challenges. And the government, and I think the public sector in general, should be stepping up to provide the right incentives and the right enabling environment to encourage entrepreneurs to address some of these critical gaps that we see in the education system, from equity issues, to protecting teachers, to ensuring the necessary supplies, to ensuring that we reach all children. Kevin, thank you so very much. So at this point, I'm going to send all of you into a breakout group with three other people. And I'm going to ask you to reflect on what you heard and talk about how this moment has impacted your own leadership, your own sense of what your opportunities and challenges are. And you will have only eight minutes to do this. So manage your time wisely. Then we will come back and we'll have a bit of a conversation, okay? so. Eight minutes, and uh, there you go. Have fun. You have to accept the invitation. You should see something that says you haven't been invited to a breakout group.
Adriana, do you see a note that says you have been assigned to a breakout group? Um, yeah, but I was the only one there. So I came back. Oh, really? Well, yeah. I can assign you to another group. Not a problem. Okay, thank you. Uh, just give me a moment. see where are you hmm, I don't know why I can't send you to a breakout group just see You're on mute, Adriana. Um, it says join breakout room at the bottom of my screen. Maybe I could join. Yeah, that's what you have to do. Say join. Okay, let me try that. Oh, it says room 11. Nobody was in there. <laughs> Is that the room you were in? Yeah. Oh, that's, yeah. So you came out. Should I try it again? Yeah, try that. Claire, are you still here? EW, are you still here? Hey, Jonathan, I have sent people to breakout groups. Are you guys two together? In, I cannot hear you, Jonathan. Uh, yeah, there didn't seem to be anyone who joined the breakout room, so I just came back to see. Hey, Adriana. Hi, that happened All to right. me too. So I'm trying to see how do I send it to a, how do I send you to a breakout group? Um, if you hover around over any breakout room, there's an option to add a participant. Or if you uh, hover around our name, there's an option to send. That's what I thought. That's what I've done before. I hover around your name and I go to those three little dots. That's right. But I don't see you assigned to a breakout room. I can send you to a waiting room, which is not what I want to do. Um, so let me just see. And you think if I go to the breakout rooms on a sign, so I wonder if because you came out, it's not allowing me to do this because it thinks you're in that room. Let me just see, let me just see. What room were you in, 11? You well, were both in 11? Know. Yeah, exactly. So I have Adriana here. So what I need to do is I need to get you out of that room. So let me say no. Yeah, and Jonathan, you were with EW who hasn't joined. So those, you should be with EW who's right here. Uh, let me just see if I can send, move to, I can certainly move you to another room that I can do. So I'm gonna do that now. Let me see if I can do that. So Jonathan, I have just moved you. Let me okay. see if I can do that with, I can do that. I can send you to another room, Adriana. There you go. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Did you get an invite? Yeah. You didn't did get not. an invite? No. Mm -hmm. I could try leaving the meeting and joining again. No, don't do that. Let's see. Okay. So you were in 11 and I sent you to room four. So you're in 11. Oh, now you're, now there's no one there. So you <laughs> may have left. Uh, wait a moment. <laughs> So sorry about this. That's okay. Let's see. So you should be at the end here, but you're not. I'm looking at all my breakout groups. Oh, this is Andrea Park. Andriana, not join. You have been invited to go to room four. Why don't you look for a message that says you have been invited to join a breakout group? I don't see it on my screen anywhere. No. Maybe mm -hmm. if you minimize the Zoom screen, maybe there is something that is blocking your pop-ups or something. Yeah, maybe. Check. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to move you to another room and see if that does it. I just sent you to room 10. Do you see a note that says you have been invited? No. Okay. <laughs> so there is something, and I can see you here, that you have been invited but have not joined room 10. 
Let me um let me check the on the bottom where it says join. Oh yeah, okay, it says I could join. There you go. All right. Cool. Thanks. All right. <laughs> Maria Elena, ¿cómo estás? Marielena, la gente está trabajando en un breakout group. ¿Quieres que te mande para allí o no? ¿En cuánto tiempo regresan? En tres minutos o algo así. Ah, bueno, ahorita me vuelvo a conectar entonces. ¿Te conectas en tres minutos? Bueno, o te quedas aquí tranquila. ¿Cómo estás? Bien, ¿tú? Oye. Muy bien. Muy bien, muy bien. ¿Cómo están tus hijas? Bien, bien, pues ya canto. ¿Viste, ¿Viste las fotos que proyecté el otro día en el evento que me invitaste? Sí, claro que las vi. ¿Las ¿Conociste? Son lindas esas fotos, ya deben estar mucho más grandes que eso, ¿no? Sí, ya, mucho más. Luego te mando la actualización. Ah, bueno, está bien, está bien. Bueno, ahorita Oye, me vuelvo a conectar. Nos vemos, ensegui nos vemos enseguida. Bueno, que estés bien. Igual. Well, it's great to see you all back. Uh, maybe we can take a few minutes to have a conversation on this question of how this pandemic has influenced your own leadership or what did you learn from hearing others reflect on how it has influenced their own sense of challenge, their own sense of possibility or responsibility. Or maybe you have thoughts on what you read in the book, if you actually read the book. So let's use the usual thing, raise your hand. We're gonna do this for about I don't know, 10, 15 minutes, and then I'm going to ask each of our panelists at the end to make a closing comment. 
on what struck them from reading all the other essays that they really hadn't thought about uh, from your own experience about leadership and the leadership opportunities in this crisis. So raise your hand and I'll call on you when you're ready. And if you don't raise your hand, I'm happy to call on you anyway. Robert, go ahead. Yeah, so a theme that came out of our conversation, I think, was that this um, challenge has forced, uh, has has allowed you know people to work across usual boundaries uh, within organizations, but then also you know within um, fields like with teachers, uh, you know, learning from teachers at other schools or you know from other systems uh, in ways that hadn't necessarily had the motivation to be done before. Um, at the, the East-West Center, we've had a lot more uh, cross-functional projects happening. Now, you know, unique challenges and then people volunteering from their various uh, offices to, to contribute to, to helping and, you know, in interactions in ways that, that certainly um, wouldn't have had the motivation to be done before. Thanks, Robert. Idea. Yeah, thank you, Fernando. Um, something that we spoke about, which um, actually Kevin spoke a little bit about, which really resonated with me, was that uh, it's really important to see partnerships between um, government, between schools, between nonprofits, just because I think that when we rely on government, we realize that sometimes bureaucracy isn't actually equipped. Um, to deal with many of the issues. From my standpoint, working with young people across Latin America, I'm realizing that the pandemic has really compounded a lot of the inequities that they face. And because my students are so diverse, I see both sides. I, I see students from private schools who schools have been able to pivot really quickly, provide them with the best schools. And I have students who are not accounted for by any institution. They're out of school right now. Um, and it's our job as a nonprofit to figure out how to engage them and how to empower them. And so if there were more um, connection and more participation just between different fields, um, I think that there's room for a lot more innovation. Thank you, Idia. I don't see other hands raised. Oh, there, uh, so maybe I'm going to ask, oh, there it is, Amelia. Just to follow up on um, Idia's point, one of the things that we noted here in my context in New York is working with young people who are incarcerated. Um, really the, uh, the, the partnership uh, with the correctional institution um, in the local schools and the library um, that really determined like, the strength of their capacity uh, really made the difference in terms of us in terms of programming and it's actually been a real challenge resuming programming um, because the, the institutions weren't designed to support remote learning so I've just been thinking a lot about what happens uh, for, for children and students who are um, in really um, just different contexts including those who are incarcerated. Thanks Amelia. So I had asked our panelists to prepare by reading the entire book, and I'm sure you read it from beginning to end. So I'm going to ask each one of them to maybe say a word or two on what did you learn from reading the entire collection of essays that you really hadn't thought about that maybe help you shift or expand your thinking in some ways. And um, just raise your hand. I'm not going to call on you. And uh, let's follow the order that you want. I can start. Go for, go for it. So I think as I read the whole book, first of all, I was humbled by how amazing each one of the chapters was because in their unique way, some were very big, some were small changes, but they all had empathy as the center of whatever it was that they had responded to the crisis. So I think for me, that was a main takeaway from this book, how the, the IEP graduates have taken empathy to another level in whatever roles they're in. And there is a spe there's one quote, especially in Adia's chapter, where she put it beautifully, and she says, the shock of the pandemic has forced us to pay closer attention to where society hurts the most. And I think when I read that quote, it resonated. It was a theme that resonated throughout all the chapters. Like, no matter where each IEP graduate is, they are listening to where society hurts the most and they are responding in whatever way they can. And so it was humbling and at the same time encouraging to see what a wonderful group of graduates we are. And so I think it was, it was beautiful to see. And then another thing that emerged as I read the book was how 
we, this crisis situation required everyone in whatever position they were to be bold and to take risks. And those risks might have been outside their comfort zone or they might have been something completely unheard of, something they had never done before, but they all stepped up to the challenge and they took the risk, even if they had incomplete data, incomplete information. And I think that taking risk was what we needed in this moment of pandemic, in this moment of crisis, to respond to our different countries' needs or different communities' needs. So I think those are two big take takeaways that I'm taking from reading all of these beautiful essays in the book. Beautiful, Angela, thank you so much. Others of you, the panelists um, or anyone if else? I can, yeah. go if ahead, I go can follow from, Go, go Jambi, can, yeah. So I think for me, um, one of the, the most amazing things to see was, it was almost magical to see how fast and how thoughtfully every single person in the book had responded to the crisis. It just gave me a lot of faith and hope in just seeing what could be if we all put our minds together and were forced to do something. And I think it was in the first chapter that I read the quote, perfection, let perfection not be the enemy of the good. And that sort of resounded through every single essay. The idea of trusting yourself and having confidence in what you're doing. The, the second thing that I really found inspiring was this blurring lines of passion and profession. Um, not a single person through the book wanted to be an educator because it was a safe choice or because it's lucrative as a profession. They wanted to do it because they truly believed that that was important. And I think there are many places where people refer to this idea of focusing on the work and letting the child be the center of it and everything else being secondary. And I found that really inspiring to me because that's something I struggle with. So it was lovely to see. I also think the, the other thing that people said a lot was um, the idea of being heartbroken if you lead with your heart is what I sort of picked up from the book. And it it's almost seems like it's impossible to avoid it. So it's okay, let's embrace it and actually use that to our strength to listen to community, to connect with the children and to trust and empower people. And then the final thing that I was going to say is actually what Angela said in the beginning, which I wrote down immediately, because it's something that really resonated with me, the idea of balancing with the urgency, as well as being patient to listen to the community as well as iterate. And I feel like these were the four themes that came out through almost every essay and they really moved me and it really made an impact on thinking about how I manage leadership. Oh, Very beautiful, inspiring. beautiful, Janvi. Thank you. Anyone else? I could, I could add some. Go for it. Uh, so I'm from where Janvi left, um, for me, like the, the things which struck the most, it was the commitment of uh, uh, all the authors and the, the commitment in a way that, um, you know, it was such a crisis moment and everybody experienced it differently, but also it was common to all of us. And uh, actually we had a choice. We had a choice to, to give up, like to be, uh, um, to be exhausted from all the extra work, uh, just you know, to, to give up. It was one choice, and the, the other choice was just to continue to do more and uh, uh, to, to to help with the situation. And uh, I, I saw like everybody making the second choice, and uh, and uh, we made it because we were so committed and we were really passionate about what we did. And that's that was also common to all of the essays and all of the authors, I guess. And the second thing is uh, introspection. Uh, it was, um, I saw the, I recognized the, the importance of introspection again uh, as leaders. So it's not all about the activities we do. It's not all about the beneficiaries we reach. It's not all about the systems, but it's also very much about us. Uh, that, uh, you know, we, we pause at the moments and uh, we, we look at ourselves, uh, we question our leadership, we, 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 uh, we question how we behave in particular situations. And then I think this is what really moves us forward. And, uh, and I saw many clues of that in uh, different essays. Thank you, Mine. I can go next, oh. Professor Reeves. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, Kevin, that's fine. Sure, I think after going through the book, I feel a sense of urgency. Um, I feel this is 
a critical moment for the global education movement with all the ideas that are there, the programs that we've developed, the research that's there, the data that's there, that this is the time to begin introducing those changes. And for me, one of the greatest things I see through this book is that we really read, we, we need to rethink funding. The programs are wonderful and inspiring and the people leading them are really incredible. But the way to sustain them is to make sure they have the right funding to make this work. And so I left, I finished reading the book with a sense of, as an educator, I need to be part of the conversations about money. And I need to be part of, of that and I need to accelerate funding for the programs and the initiatives that so many of my fellow classmates are pioneering. And so that is for me one of the most critical takeaways is that this is a moment for change in the global education movement. This is an opportunity for IEP graduates to continue leading that change. And one of the best ways we can do that is about accelerating funding for global education. Thank you, Kevin. Nicole. Um, so I think from the beginning of the book, Fernando sets out the size of the challenge and establishing that defining priorities will not be an easy task. Um, it will involve finding balance between different, different concerns that are all equally important. And I think the, the, the essays felt like a critical mass of cases and experiences um, in what it means to, to intentionally and honestly recognize what it is that can be achieved and what will not, but not let that be an impediment to taking action. This morning with Professor Noel McGinn, he, mentioned, he, he said, he, he prompted us and encouraged us to ask ourselves, what is possible? Asking what is possible, what can be achieved not, and what cannot, but not to be defeated, but to mobilize us towards action and to think more systemically. Um, and I think in, in, in all of the essays, I think some, someone else already brought this up, but the idea that what was really uh, woven into all of them was a sense of mission, the clarity of mission, that it is to educate all and all is all. And so even the discomfort with the insufficiency of some solutions comes from a sense of commitment to this idea that all children must be educated and we are a part of making that happen. Um, so I guess taking, the, I, I took a, from that as a lesson on my own work um, that that commitment and that sense of mission cannot be taken for granted. Um, and it is why I love the IEP program so much and, and all of my, my friends and colleagues, uh, but that, that oftentimes get, takes a uh, second stage to all of the more technical concerns, but all of the action that we have seen happen and that is registered in, in, these, in these essays was possible because there was a sense, a, a clear sense of mission um, that is not, you cannot force on other people. You have to build it together. Um, so I think I take away that that's something that I, I, I must incorporate into the way I approach my relationship building and my work with other people because a lot of powerful things can happen when that's clear. Thank you, Nicole. Maybe this is a good time to invite Seth or Felipe to remind us of this Google document that you have created which is an opportunity for us to reflect a little bit on the current moment and what we want to do. Seth, are you prepared to do that? Or Felipe, if you're here? Yes, definitely. Um, I, I see Felipe has always has beaten me to the punch and shared it again in the, in the chat. Um, it's, it, it, as it says at the top, this is meant to be an exercise in collective creation. Um, I believe that there's something unique and powerful about the IEP cohort. Um, each each year. I mean, I, I remember being in Fernando's class in 2006, 2007. Um, it's, it's where I met, uh, in the sections where I met uh, Luis Garcia and, and my business partner and founded my company. Um, so there's a lot of things that come from, from this side um, that are very powerful. Uh, and I believe it's from the exercise of this amazing community of combining thoughts respectfully, of agreeing and disagreeing on what matters. Um, and I think it's something that I believe that the IEP cohort has come a long way um, and has, has evolved over the years, um, and, but has some sort of core beliefs that are important to put out. Um, and I, I do believe, I, I really appreciate, Fernando, what you're saying, that this is a moment for solidarity 
Um, and it could be an interesting moment to say, well, what do we believe? What, what as a community of practice are the tenants that we think are important and we want to stand by? Um, and so these are meant to be the conference takeaways, questions, suggestions are all just meant to be a, a place to begin to put some things down that we can look at and sort of see if we can create together a, a manifesto or at least an outcome statement um, from our time together today. So it just quickly approaching 12 hours now. So it's moving strong. <laughs> Thank you. And I, and I think the time is right because we admitted this year the last cohort of the IEP. So once this cohort graduates, some of them will graduate this year, uh, others will graduate next year, there will no longer be an IEP. We're gonna create something else, as I say in the introduction, there will be other ways in which the school will engage, but it will not be the same. And, uh, and I think that uh, you will have to decide as a community, what kind of community do you wanna be? And uh, I may or may not be in a position to be sending emails to people or to bringing you together. So you will have to decide what kind of responsibility do you take for yourselves as a, as a community. And I think that this document might be a step in that direction. When we planned this party, uh, which is something that we talked about a year ago, I did say to Andy, I said, I want us to do a big party. I want us to uh, close this chapter in our careers in a, in a real way. And that's why we invited all of you a year ago and said, come to Harvard. We want this to be the biggest celebration of the IEP ever. Uh, I hope it's not the last, but it could very well be the last if nobody uh, picks, up, uh, picks up the responsibility of organizing what's next. So what, what I have learned uh, from, this chat, from reading that is something that uh, I've, I've always known about all of you, which is that collaboration is such a power tool, powerful tool, right? That if you, uh, you know, every small step in a context of everybody doing a small step can move mountains. When, when, I be, when I reached out to Andreas and many others uh, back in March, because I thought this is going to be a terrible night for education around the world, and I frankly didn't know what to do. And I, I called them and we said, well, let's do a survey. And uh, we did do a survey and no one else had done a survey. So we got to talk to tons of people. And the more I talked to them, the more this courage I became that I said, oh my God, I'm just gonna be, be, become the prophet of doomsday. I'm gonna become the prophet of the loss of educational gains made of the last two decades. And how good is that? And I said, I, I, I need to do something else. And I remember something that I've taught some of you in my class, uh, which is the power of positive deviance. You may remember that book. Uh, you know, sometimes if you find things that are good, and you study them, that can inspire others. And I reached out to this network. I reached out to you and I said, would you help me find some positive deviance? And I'm so grateful that so many of you um, basically step up and you know, lo and behold, we wrote 30 case studies. And we did that in about six weeks. And uh, the number of people that I have heard from who have said that was so useful for me to see what some, it, those case studies created kind of a new sense of accountability, right? How do you hide? Uh, how do you stop from doing something when you realize that in context with a lot less resources than you have, there are people doing the very best they can. And the same is the case with this book, right? Uh, when I thought of putting this thing together, I certainly didn't have time to write another book by myself, but I thought, well, I can write a chapter. And if I get other people to write a chapter, together we'll write a book. And, uh, and so that's how we did it. And I realized there was effort involved and I appreciate that those of you who stepped up took the effort to do it and had the time and the opportunity. I know that others would have done the same thing if they had been in a position to do that, but it was doable, right? And together it has a different kind of heft and perhaps can make a different kind of contribution. So for me, that's the takeaway. It's the power of uh, doing things with others and of, uh, I mean, the true power of collaboration, uh, which requires, you know, doing your share, trusting, treating other people in a way that they'll want to collaborate with you again. I mean, all the obvious stuff that you all know so well. So I think on that note, I just want to thank uh, our panelists. I want to thank all of you who agreed to write a chapter for this book. And um, I am ready to turn this over to the next section. So I'm going to call on Seth or Felipe to lead us into the next activity. Thank you. Please give a round of applause to these wonderful panelists that spoke today.